Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolf. On this edition, plasma rocket science. But first up, here's the news. <laughs> Free speech for disabled children. Rick Morton, writing for the Australian newspaper, is pushing to narrow the definition of autism. Unfortunately, that will mean that fewer children can access help for their disabilities. Autism is a neurological disorder diagnosed on the basis of abnormal communication, social skills and behaviour. The number of children accessing the government's Helping Children with Autism program is higher than what they predicted. 2.5% of children under 5 are diagnosed with autism, compared with 1.5% of children aged 10 to 11. This could be caused by something in the environment causing more children to develop autism. It could be caused by doctors becoming better at recognising autism as they gain experience. Or it could be caused by a massive incompetence in Australia's population of doctors in every single state, leading to an expensive overdiagnosis of autism in children, egged on by parents after free money. In The Australian, Rick Morton accuses the doctors for using wriggle room to fudge diagnoses and parents for doctor shopping. He quotes various academics as advising that the diagnostic procedure for autism be tightened to stick strictly to the discredited Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or DSM-5, ignoring any judgment from people who've actually examined the children. He quotes an academic who talks about some story he heard about doctor shopping where he basically blames the parents of disabled children, when as a scientist he should give a disclaimer that anecdotal evidence is scientifically worthless. The story quotes the Federal Government's Productivity Commission, who have no medical qualifications between them, as believing that families just want the money that the rise in diagnoses of autism was at least partly linked to the money in the Helping Children with Autism program. Because it's too popular. Speech therapy is too popular? It's a strange way to look at an early intervention program to teach children to cope with profound neurological problems. The American National Institute of Mental Health has rejected the DSM-5 because it's not evidence-based. Instead, it's based on voting. Voting has passed its usefulness in determining what's true in science. The DSM-5 has even been criticised by the chairman of the earlier DSM-4 for, among other things, making normal grieving of the death of a loved one into a psychiatric pathology requiring drug treatment. So, what happens to the children who have all the problems of autism but are rejected from getting help by the strict application of the DSM-5 algorithm for pre-programmed diagnosis. It might save money and seem simpler and tidier than specialist judgment on a case-by-case basis, but where does a lack of early intervention lead? It was recently revealed that in Queensland, an eight-year-old child was locked in a darkened storeroom more than 20 times at Kawungan State School in Harvey Bay, yet Education Queensland tried to pass it off as a timeout. A 10-year-old autistic student was locked in a cage in a Canberra school, although the principal was dismissed after an inquiry found that she was the sole instigator of the decision. In October 2015, a daycare centre in Melbourne was found to have put children with autism in a coffin-sized desensitising box in a classroom. In November 2015, a boy with autism in Blacktown had been found chained in his house by his parents. Children with autism can be very disruptive and upsetting to deal with if they're not given the early intervention they need. I understand the siren appeal of bypassing professional judgement with a simple checklist, 
and the fear that doctors are fudging diagnoses to help poor parents, thus increasing the amount of money the government pays out. But they're both the result of poor thinking. Medical diagnoses is complicated, especially for children with developmental and behavioural problems, and it can't be reduced to a checklist of criteria that were voted on. Science isn't a democracy. The parents who use the early intervention schemes don't get to pocket the money. It's used for six hours a week of speech therapy, occupational therapy, and psychological therapy. Poor disabled kids who currently get free speech therapy and learn to talk won't get this help if the definition narrows to exclude them. The current flexible system of diagnosis based on examination and assessment of individual needs can lead to kids being given the power of speech for free. Free speech is a good thing. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Electric spaceships more powerful per gram of fuel than any chemical rocket? Patrick Paddy Noman has just completed his PhD in physics from the University of Sydney and the City University of Hong Kong. His thesis was in plasma spacecraft propulsion systems. He is a rocket scientist. I spoke with him after he gave a talk at the Orbit Oz Space Entrepreneur Meetup at the Fishburners co-working space in Sydney. The people at the meeting were talking all around us as the quiet spaces I usually record in were locked up. I began by asking Paddy, what is plasma? Plasma can be thought of as like a fourth state of matter. So you know how with solids, liquids and gases, they've all got atoms and electrons, right? You put enough energy into a gas, you can make the electrons whizzing around the atoms jump away. So you have all these negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions floating around. And these ionized species are subject to electric and magnetic fields. And so you can use electric and magnetic fields to grab them, guide them, direct them, accelerate them, do all kinds of cool stuff with them. And if you you ionize enough of the gas, you can grab hold of the entire gas just by grabbing hold of the ionized species, and they drag along the neutral species, and that's a plasma. Fire's a kind of plasma, lightning's a kind of plasma, the glowy stuff in neon tubes, these are all types of plasmas. And so this will be an electric rocket? Yes. With a chemical rocket, the energy to make it go comes from the chemical energy inside the, the fuel. When the fuel reacts with the oxidizer, you get a bunch of heat, you get a bunch of pressure, and the exhaust comes squirting out the back end of it. Sometimes it comes squirting out in a jet of fire like you see on the television. Sometimes it it comes out at just high-pressure gas like the rockets they use to do orbit maintenance in space. With an electric propulsion system, you have to apply the energy electrically, and there are various ways of doing this, but you put the electrical energy into your propellant and it comes out the back end at high velocity, fairly low thrust because there's not much of it coming out in a given time, but what comes out comes out real fast, so it's really efficient. And so the electric spaceships we have at the moment are ion drives, but they're kind of weak. How is yours different? My system is different in a couple of ways. From the, the way the system works, my system is effectively an arc welder in a suit and a tie. It works very similar to how an electric arc welder does its thing, which means its reaction mass, what actually squirts out the back end to make thrust happen, that's made of a metal. I've tested magnesium, I've tested uh, aluminium and titanium, I've tested a range of things, and they all work to a greater or lesser extent depending on the material and the conditions. What the current ones that you, they use today use is xenon gas, and they use they're set on gas at high voltage and low current, so they don't have much moving out the back end of it. It's a, a case of comparing two different systems, but when the xenon ion systems are going, they might give you uh, they might give you 50 millinewtons, which is about the weight of a postage stamp. But they do that all the time. When my system goes, it operates as in short, sharp pulses, so that for a third of a millisecond, you're having eight newtons, which is about the, le- the, about the weight of a long neck beer bottle, full of beer, resting on your hand, for a third of a millisecond. And if you can do that ten times a second, 
it all adds up and winds up to being more thrust over that second than you get with the small thrust for the longer time. It's two different systems operate two different ways, but if you work it, bet work it the right way, my system can work better. Where will the electricity come from? Is it battery operated? You can use batteries to run the system uh, when it's in shadow, but a better way of running it would be off solar panels. So you're going to need a fair amount of power to make it run. You're going to need a few kilowatts. So you're going to need large solar arrays. Solar arrays are getting better and better, but you still need a fair amount of solar power. If you have a big chunky battery, sort of like uh, the one ton lithium ion batteries you'd see on, a, uh, on the Tesla cars, sure, you could run it for a few hours in, uh, in darkness, but that's a ton worth of mass you could use for other things. You might have a, a small battery to run your computers while you're coasting through the night phase when you get back out in the sunlight, you turn your solar panels to maximum efficiency angle and you just gun it. How does the capability of a plasma rocket compare to, say, the chemical rockets we're using now? The difference in capabilities between chemical rockets and the electric systems is mainly a case of mass efficiency. The engineers use the term specific impulse, often called bounce per ounce, in order to, deter to compare different systems and how well they produce thrust. A chemical system will give you about 300, maybe 450 seconds of specific impulse. Bigger numbers are better numbers because it means your system is more mass efficient. A whole effect thruster will give you maybe 1500 to 2500 seconds, so it's already more than five times as good at the top end. A gridded ion thruster, using xenon as fuel, will get you maybe four and a half thousand. An experimental one might get you over 9000. Under certain tests I've done, I've managed to get 14,500. So the capabilities are much, much greater because the system gives you a lot more bounce per ounce of fuel. So you've been doing this research for your PhD, which you've completed. Where are things at? So I've finished up my PhD, and myself and some friends who are also mad keen space fans we have decided to form a startup company, Neumann Space, PTYLTD. We've got a company register with ASIC. It's all, it's all on the level. And we're at the point right now of looking for investors to give us the cash we need to go with the next generation of prototyping so that we can move from what is admittedly a really cool laboratory experiment, but it's just a lab test bed. And we need to move that into engineering prototypes that we can test. We can find out where the bugs are so that we can then fix them. And in a couple of years' time, we can then have something we'd be confident enough to put on a rocket and send up into space. Once you've done all that, and these are in space, what will these let us do? These will let us do a whole bunch of really cool things. So one of the things we've been playing around with are, uh, are, are some designs, some mission concepts that this system enables, mainly so that we can identify potential customers who might want to invest in us at this stage so we can, you know get our cash together, right? So, you know, it's a little bit of altruism, a little bit of cold mercenary calculation at this point. But anyway, what this thing enables, we've done some numbers and we reckon that with some very conservative estimates, if we assume that half of our total spaceship mass is fuel, we've got about 55 kilometers per second of delta V, which means how much velocity change we can have for our big spaceship. 55 and a half kilometers a second feels like a large number, but if you don't have your head around what the solar system's size is, you don't really get much of an idea. But here's it in perspective. If you get up into low Earth orbit using a chemical rocket, it'll take seven kilometers per second to go from low Earth orbit to geosynchronous Earth orbit. So if you've got 50 k's a second to play around with, you can not only get up to geosynchronous orbit, you can stay there for a very, very long time using your rocket thruster very sparingly for orbit maintenance and station keeping. Or you can go to a near-Earth asteroid, which are between 6 and 12 kilometers per second from low Earth orbit. Or you can go to Mars, which is 15 kilometers per second away. Uh, by the way, that's Mars orbit, not Mars capture. So you go from low Earth orbit, spiral out away from the Earth, go through the solar system, spiral in towards a low, Earth, low Mars orbit, rather, and that'll take you 15 k's per second. And main belt asteroids such as Ceres or Psyche or, or Vesta, that'll be about 16, 17 k's per second, maybe a bit more if it's got a high orbital inclination. That means its orbit is at a strange angle to the orbit of the Earth. You want to go to Jupiter? That's 
25, maybe 30 k's per second. So you time it just right, you might be able to get to Jupiter and back. These are some of the things you can do. Other things, you can refuel your system. If your fuel is a solid rod of metal, it's really easy to, to, to refuel it because when your fuel rod's just about worn out, you just unscrew it, you put it away safely, and you screw in a new one. No worries, it's good to go. You can use this to refuel satellites that are, that are up in space. You can use it to refuel ships after they've gone to Mars, dropped off co uh, some cargo, and then come back empty. You can reuse stuff in space. This is a really big possibility of game changing because it will help reduce cost barriers to low earth orbit oh, sorry reduce cost barriers to the inner solar system because it allows recycling of stuff in space and also we've tested metals such as aluminium titanium magnesium these are the aerospace metals they're called this for a reason because this is what you use to build satellites and spacecraft there are six to 7,000 tons of space junk currently in orbit around the Earth. Most of it's going to be some combination of aluminium, magnesium, titanium. We reckon we can recycle this, turn it into fuel, and not only use it to fuel our own ships if we decide to build our own, but if people want to go up there and as other companies, they want to capture these bits of space junk, they want to melt them down, they want to sell people these fuel rods, I say more power to them. They're building a market for stuff in space. Is this going to help people wanting to mine the asteroids? I think it will help with asteroid mining because it helps them in a couple of ways. Firstly, it changes the scope of things that are valuable in Earth orbit. The various asteroid mining companies, uh, you, you hear a bunch of stuff going around Facebook of people thinking that platinum is the best thing ever. So this asteroid is worth so much platinum, so, so many billions of dollars because there's so, many, so much platinum in it. And the people who are in the business of wanting to mine asteroids know that this is a terrible business plan because it would cost so much to go up there, refine the platinum and then bring it back to Earth that it's just not worth it. The things that are worth a lot in space are, of course, what people are willing to pay for and you just don't need much platinum in space. What you do need is stuff to run your life support system, so that's water and nitrogen and carbon dioxide and sulfur and phosphorus and all these other really cool elements, and you can find those on carbonaceous chondrites. You're also going to need metals in order to build space habitats, space stations, satellites, whatever have you, and you can find those on nickel-iron asteroids, and also we know that larger carbonaceous chondrites contain metallic nodules in them. So if an asteroid miner, say, wants to go out and grab a thousand ton worth of carbonaceous chondrite asteroid, take it back to Earth, they could sell people the water, the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the sulfur for their life support systems. They could use the metallic nodules for building equipment, supplies to make new habitats. And then there's also, on the surface of these carbonaceous asteroids, some kerogenic carbon, which is carbon that's been cooked down a little bit by cosmic rays. So it's kind of like soot, kind of like coal sort of graphite sort of stuff. What our system enables, because it runs on conductive material, is you can scrape off the carbon off the outside. There's maybe a couple of centimeters worth of kerogenic carbon. Grab it, put it in the little uh, furnace, boil out all the volatiles so it's a nice compact chunk of graphite and use that as fuel we've tested carbon it works all right it's not the best but if you're already bringing back a couple of a, a, a thousand ton of carbonaceous chondrite and you've got more carbon than you know what you do with you might as well use it as fuel if it's the low value stuff you've got in the asteroid so potentially these plasma rockets could actually be able to use different sources of fuels very much so um Again, one of the things you've played with is, let's say you've got uh, different, different mission parameters and different phases of your mission. So there's a point in time where you want to use a high thrust. You'd swap in your molybdenum cathode for that. We've tested Molly. Molly works really well as a high thrust fuel, gets high, high impulse output per second. It works really well, but it's not the most efficient one we've got. So let's say you've got a time critical uh, satellite. It's got to get from low Earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit. And it's got to get there in as short a time as possible. So it's then on orbit and earning you money as soon as possible. So you'd use your molybdenum cathode to go up. Then when you're on orbit, you want to be able to stay there for as long as possible, which means you want your really efficient fuel. 
that's when you switch to your switch to say your magnesium cathode, which is lower thrust for, for less energy and much less mass flow. So it'll a given mass of magnesium will keep you up on orbit for a much longer time. How you do this? Are there a couple of ways of doing this? We possibly favor, say, a revolver model where you, you revolve your cathodes around into the uh, firing position, you fire away your, your molybdenum cathode until it's worn down and you're on orbit, and then you swap on your, your magnesium and stay there for as long as it lasts. In conclusion, I reckon this system could help revolutionize humanity's access to the inner solar system because it's not only a really good rocket, it also allows us to use in situ resources as fuel and thus creates a market in space. We're not in this necessarily to get rich. We're not in this to commercialize space because that's already happening with communication satellites. We're in this to help industrialize space and help move humanity into the broader solar system as a multi-planet species. Well, Paddy Noman, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. That was Dr. Paddy Noman talking about his pulsed plasma rocket engines. You can find out more at N-E-U-M-A-N-N space dot com. Because you know I... Because you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space. Yeah, it's pretty clear. I ain't commercial crew, but I can launch it, launch it like I'm supposed to be. Cause I got that boom, boom that all the astros chase. All the space flight to all the right places. I see Orion crew working that ship nonstop. You know we're going far. Now put that last on top. If you got boosters, boosters, just raise them up. Cause every spacecraft needs propulsion from the bottom to the top. Hey, they're working so hard. Don't you love these NASA guys? They will take us so far the first time that Cause you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space. I'm bringing rockets back. Go ahead and tell the whole world that. Come on board, it's that. Cause every spacecraft needs propulsion from bottom to the top. Hey, they're working so hard, don't you love these NASA guys? They will take us so far the first time that Orion flies. You know we're traveling to deep destinations for too long. So if that's what you're in, Cause you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, Woo! about that space, space travel. That was all about that space by the NASA Johnson Space Center interns. A big thank you to Andrew from Melbourne for his monthly donation. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to join us? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. You can send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, helpful suggestions, and donations 
to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please do send me an email so I know you're listening and would like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the community radio network, including 2 Triple H in Hornsby, Karingai, 2 MVR in Nambaka Valley, 2 XX in Canberra, and 3 MBR in the Mallee border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then explore more than 700 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords, so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Hello, this is Ian Wolfe, producer of Diffusion Science Radio. This show depends on your support. Please make a donation directly with the PayPal button at www.diffusionradio.com or support Diffusion by downloading a free audiobook from audibletrial.com slash science or go to diffusionradio.com slash support and click on an Amazon link or buy my nano drones.